So welcome, I'm, uh, I'm Chris Kate. I'm the Chief Information Officer for Cox Target Media, which owns Valpac and Savings.com. Today I'm gonna talk about, uh, the title is I Bought a Startup. Now, so just so you guys understand, I didn't fund this out of my bank account, so. <laughs> but I led the acquisition of Savings.com for Cox Target Media and, and for Cox. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about just that journey and from an acquirer perspective, uh, you know, the, the kind of emotions we went through, the journey to buy a company, um, the alternatives that we looked at, some of the, the starts and stops of that process. And then I'll also try to interject some seller points of view along the way as well. So, you know, what were the sellers thinking about as we reflect on the deal now? What maybe are some of the advice that the sellers maybe should have thought about before, you know, we completed the transaction? So I'll try to get two views as we go through this presentation. So uh, feel free to, to, to raise your hands if you've got questions as we go through this. Um, so we bought savings.com. They are based in Santa Monica, California. They've got about 70 employees. They are in the affiliate marketing space. And so Valpac is traditionally in the local SMB space or selling coupons to the pizza guy or the dry cleaners or you know, hyper local space. Savings.com is coming from this at, at the national brand side, so Macy's and Kohl's and, and uh, Home Depot, et cetera, pure online company driven through promotional codes of, uh, in the affiliate marketing space. So we saw great synergies on, on bringing this company into the fold, into the Cox Target Media fold. Um, and so these are just some of the brands that you can see that Savings.com deals with that Valpac, our national sales organization within Valpac, always had a problem getting to because most of these national organizations look, like, look at Valpac as if they're just a local organization, not somebody that should be dealing with the national side. So as we thought about our journey, you know, we, we had some needs that we were trying to, to solve. Um, and so when we looked at our needs, really we are trying to transform our business into a digital company. And so Valpac traditionally has been a print organization. We mail our blue envelopes to 40 million households every month. Um, but we need to transform ourselves to digital. Savings.com is a pure digital startup. So they've never had a traditional business. And so we wanted to grow our business. We also wanted to obtain some digital expertise. So although we understand the digital marketplace, Valpac didn't live in the startup world of, of you know, their whole company being based on making money online. So we've got our print business supporting us as, as we evolve the Valpac brand. So we need to go out and get those really smart people. So that was another thing that we were looking for. Uh, also looking for technology. So did they have some technology or did the, this space have some technology that we could leverage uh, for not only the affiliate marketing space but bringing that technology back into the Valpac business as well. Um, we wanted to get into new business models. So Valpac's been a 40 plus year old company very ingrained business model. We wanted to get into other models like the affiliate marketing space, CPG, et cetera. Uh, and that was the other thing we were looking for. Uh, expand reach and content to new consumer audiences. So Valpac's got a pretty set audience. Well, we just doubled that with BoltingSavings.com onto our company with their, new, their online audience as well and, and their blogger networks. Um, and then one of the most important things from a business model perspective is the savings.com entity or the affiliate marketing space is a pay per performance type of business. And so when we drive somebody to the coal site and they buy clothes or whatever they're gonna buy from there, we get paid on the affiliate marketing side on the total, on a commission on the total sale of the basket online. Valpac, on the other hand, is always usually paid up front marketing, so cost per thousand of distribution for the message, and it's write me a big check up front where the savings model is whatever sales we drive, you're gonna give us a commission on, so two different, very, two very different models. So we took a very opportunistic approach to looking for a company to buy. So we didn't necessarily say that we were gonna have a deal done within a year. We, we, thought we wanted to get into this marketplace and we started exploring it, and, but we weren't really seeking a specific acquisition target at the time. Um, our initial partnerships led to acquisition talks. And so I've got a couple mentions about this. If you're a seller, don't underestimate your 
partners that you're working with for a potential buyer in the future. Um, when we did look at, when we did get really interested about the affiliate marketing spaces, we started to see synergies between what Valpac did traditionally and what affiliate marketers do. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we wanted to jump into this. And then their complementary business models, as I said, you know, Savings.com was a national, uh, dealt with national brands, Valpac deals with local brands, and that gives us a full range of clients all the way from the pizza guy all the way up to the Macy's national merchant retailers. So that's kind of where our journey started. So things to consider from a seller perspective, again, I just mentioned it, don't discount your partners. So Fred Stubbe in the back was one of the first people to talk to savings.com, I think in 2010 maybe, and it was just about, hey, maybe we should do a partnership together because you have distribution, you could use our content, et cetera. So it started off as initial conversation. I don't think either one of us were thinking at the time that we were gonna buy or sell to one another. Um, so don't discount that. So again, if you're a seller, sell your value all the time. So throughout all, all of our conversations that we were having with uh, savings.com and all of the interactions, they were constantly selling their value prop. All right, They didn't know we wanted to buy them at the time, but they just believed in what they were doing. And so every opportunity they took, uh, the opportunity to tell us about their great blogger networks, their great consumers, their great brand message, their promise to save people money through affiliate marketing. Um, and then really think if you want to sell your company, what kind of organization do you want to be? Right? So I think this is one that uh, we're still exploring right now with the savings.com folks. So they were a very startup-driven company to solve a problem for consumers. And so when they sold to us, we're an operator of businesses. So Cox Enterprises, Cox Businesses, Cox Target Media and Valpac, we expect to operate this business for 20 or 30 years. We, we are an operator of companies. So there's a very fine line to make sure you understand when you sell your businesses. Do you want to be in an operational company that still does innovation, or do you want to sell to a big investor who's going to dump another $500 million into your company to, to make it something big, to spin it off an IPO or what have you? So culturally, when you sell, you just need to understand what side of that fence do you work on, or do you care? You know, do you, did you have a question, Fred? Yeah, I was just going to ask, how important is culture in a cultural fit in these types of deals? So culture is very, very important, and one of the reasons we had alternatives to pick other companies, but we kept coming back to the cultural connection that we had with the folks that worked there. The management team and the employees deeply cared about what they were doing, um, and we've, we've melded ourselves, Valpac and Savings.com together like we've been working together for 10 years. It's a very natural fit. Whereas, I'll talk about it in a minute, other acquisition targets would be things like we'd have to replace their management team. Or we'd have to, you know, put our people in there to run it because you just could tell that the, the cultural fit wasn't there between the organizations. Um, and I'll talk to that in a minute. Yes, that's, that's our goal at this moment for the foreseeable future. And so one of my responsibilities out of this acquisition is I drive the revenue synergies between the two companies. And so what we're doing is creating a whole new business kind of in the middle between the two brands. And we want them to keep doing what they're doing as their core, and we want Valpac to keep doing what they're doing. All right, so this is just kind of a, uh, a view of kind of complementary business models. Valpac website on the left featuring a lot of local stuff. Savings.com, um, one of their old screenshots on the right featuring, you know, the national merchants. So again, when we looked at assets, you know, we talked about the creating the value in the middle. You know, Savings.com brings what they call a deal pro network, which is a, a reach of about, uh, audience of about 50 million consumers through deal pro bloggers, which are kind of mommy bloggers, stay at home, drive a lot of traffic. We do a, a tremendous amount of business uh, through those channels. Uh, we've got, uh, again, great relationships with the Macy's and the Coles the of the world, uh, user-generated content, tech expertise syndication network. So lots of value on that side. On the Valpac side, we've got a franchise network. So we've got presence, local sales force in the US and Canada, about 800 sales reps on the street. 
We've got our print product that we can extend to driving people online or uh, people in the store or online to purchase. Um, we do, on the Valpac side, we do a lot of celebrity endorsements. So we bring, you know, we're doing things with Disney and other big companies that we can bring to the savings.com site as well. We've got a manufacturing plant that we invested $220 million in back, of, you know, back in 2007 that we are the most efficient short-run printer in the world. So on, on our Valpac blue envelope coupons that you get in the mail maybe, nobody touches those until you open them in your mailbox. So think about that distribution channel and that uh, um, outlet for Macy's to put their content in. Right? That's one of the synergies. And so again, when we looked at bringing these two together, we've got not only local focus, now we've got mass national distribution focus as well. Um, we've got editorial content from these blogger networks, so they're creating great SEO content for us and links back to our sites. Um, we've got leading edge tech. Uh, we are uh, basically the savings.com guys follow the lean startup methodology of coding, do two, two drops to production a day, uh, continuous deployment. So they're probably about a year, year and a half away from, from a development efficiency cycle than Valpac is, but we're catching up. Um, and then digital scale. You know, they built a business from scratch in the dis digital side. So when I said that I bought a startup, okay, one of the first things I'll tell you is I underestimated this effort quite tremendously when I first <laughs> began this journey myself. So this kind of talks about the team that we had to go through this um, acquisition. So I've got a boss, who Michael Vivio, that, that runs Cox Target Media. Him and I were basically the ones driving this, um, and I did it on the day-to-day -day basis for, for the organization. But our Cox Media Group, our parent company, had finance people and strategy people and lawyers and bankers. We had, you know, a, again, another 10 or 11 people on the team that supported me through this acquisition process. Uh, then on the savings.com side, you know, they had five of their senior management team on the other side of the table. They had two lawyers, they had two bankers. So if you can kind of think about bankers talking together, lawyers talking together, senior management talking together, this becomes a pretty daunting task to try to get a deal done, right? So um, the team was pretty big. So walking through the timeline, um, just to kind of give you a flavor of how long this took to close. So again, I mentioned Fred in the back of the room, uh, found these guys at ILM West, did, did some conversations with them. In uh, 2011, in August, we really started exploring some detailed partnerships. They came to us and said they wanted access to our print envelope to put Macy's coupons into there as a partnership. And that's when we started thinking, well, why would we give them that? Maybe we should just buy them, right? So we, we, we started really deepening our partnerships talk, talks. So in o October of 2011, we both agreed that this would be a good thing to put these two companies together, and we got to a place where there was an intent to purchase. We started getting bankers and lawyers involved on a cursory view. So again, we're still talking at this point. Formal documents aren't in place, but we've agreed in principle that we should explore this deal. November 2011, we start sharing data. And so this is probably a little weird because the savings.com guys opened up all of their data to us before the lawyers and bankers really got involved. Right, so if you can think, we got their P&Ls, we got all their commission rates, we got all their customer list, and so we had such a good partnership between senior execs at that point, we actually kind of got all the due diligence stuff up front before any of the people that usually like to drive those contracts got involved. Um, and actually, at some point, the lawyer said, stop talking, <laughs> you know, stop. Um, we started modeling synergies as well, so again, before the bureaucrats got involved, we were starting to envision what this business would look like together and the new revenue streams we could create. Um, and so then from a due diligence perspective, I started looking for alternatives, saying, okay, we're committed now to being the, in the affiliate marketing space. We, we want to, to play here. Who are the other five choices that I could go buy besides savings.com? So we started exploring that. Um, we created the more formal acquisition team that I showed you on the previous slide. So we started getting our parent company's assets together. Savings.com started getting their lawyers and bankers together. And then um, we started talking about uh, funding discussions. Um, 
Should we go look for a partner to help us buy this company? Or should we have Cox self-fund this initiative for us? So either we were going to go find a, another investor to help us afford this, or our parent company was going to write us the check and basically self-fund us. And so there were lots of discussions all the way up to the Cox Enterprise chain about what we wanted to do there. Did we want to own it wholly as a you know, Cox subsidiary, or do we want a partner involved? Um, so then in December 2011, we really started get in, getting into the discounted cash flow analysis, you know, where the, the analysts really start looking at the possibilities here. And what is this business worth? What should we pay for it? What are their comparable comps in the marketplace that, you know, if there is, is people selling in, in, the, in the space, what, what are they going for? And then we got into a uh, verbal discussion about offer. So we presented a verbal offer to say, could we buy your company for X? And they flatly said, nope, go away. <laughs> so we thought we did, did the right thing, but you know, our bankers and lawyers and analysts said, lowball them, right? Give them a lowball number. And they quickly came back and said, nope, we're worth more than that. So we move on. We get into February 2012. We are now restructuring the deal. We are now trying to figure out how to get this to work. We've got a certain amount of budget now approved at the CEI board level, all the way at the top of Cox Enterprises, which has 80,000 employees or what have you. Um, so we've got a number to work with now. So not only do I know my number to work with for savings.com, but I know my spend rate if I have to go buy one of these other five companies that we're looking at as well. Um, we created a formal term sheet at this point too that said, here's our better offer, right? We lowballed them before. Now we said, okay, here's a better offer. And we did it formally in a term sheet. Um, and then we continued negotiating on deal points. So in March, they said, nah, thanks, but no thanks. Still not good enough. And we're exhausted by this point, but we're continuing to go through. So uh, we go into more uh, negotiations. Finally, you know, through later, later March, we finally start to understand and accept the terms of the deal. Both sides are starting to do that. So then we go into a formal diligence process. Okay, so we've been talking a lot up to this point. We've got all of their balance sheets. So when we got into diligence, you know, that's where you're supposed to uncover all of the uh, various things of the business. You know, we even poked more about their business. They wanted to poke at ours to make sure, you know, we weren't hiding any losses or anything on our side as well. So we did a little bit of a uh, diligence on both sides. And then in April, we, uh, um, we decided how we were going to run the companies. And so, so to your point about were we going to put them together, were we going to keep them separate, were we going to keep them separate and drive synergies. So we made that decision back in April to keep them separate, let them continue to drive and invest in both, and then create the synergies in the middle, and that's what we were going to drive towards. Um, we notified our Valpac franchise board. So we're a franchise organization. So we actually have very complex rules about w who can call on what accounts. And so savings.com being a national company, sometimes they have uh, coupons from Groupon on their site for local businesses. Well, that competes with what our Valpac franchises do on the local side. So we had bunches of legal stuff to work out so that we weren't in violation of our Valpac franchise agreement when we bought this company. Um, and that's the legal implications. So then in May 2012, we've actually got the merger documents drafted. So this is when the lawyers are working till 3 a.m. every night, 4 a.m. on Sundays. You know, we're all very, very exhausted by this point. We just kind of want this to either be done or we want to go buy somebody else because, you know, after going through all the ups and downs of the rejection and the letters and the deals and the deal points, you know, we were very tired by this point and almost ready to say we're done if this doesn't go through. If we have one more hitch, we're done, we're walking away. Um, and then again, we ran into, it in May, significant detail work on the deal points. So s investment of stock options, earnouts, management bonuses, how the cash is going to be paid. You know, we were trying to pay as little cash up front and put it all in performance. They were trying to get as much cash up front and little performance. And so we, we had the um, to, to walk through all of that. And then in June of 2012, we actually closed the deal. And I think we were exhausted on our side, and they were popping champagne bottles on their side. Um, 
And it just so happens about nine months later, a lot of their senior management had kids, so maybe something else, maybe something, <laughs> something else happened when they were popping champagne bottles as well. Um, so, so things to consider is, you know, don't uh, underestimate the effort to sell or, or buy a company. I did, and, and my eyes are wide open now about how complex it is, and making sure you got the right people involved. Um, again, you need to rely on experts. So I, I never thought we would have so many complex legal documents to work through. Um, expect stop and go moments. So we probably thought this deal was dead three or four times on both sides. And so the only thing that keeps that together when you're in that um, situation is the relationships that you have with the other person on the other side of the phone to where you can speak honestly and work through the problems. Otherwise, we would have walked through this, or walked away from this deal. Um, and then have a backup. So, you know, I had several people that I was going to go buy if this one fell through. Okay, and last but not least, when you're doing diligence and your HR people and your security people and your health and wel welfare people and all of the, you know, kind of people that don't really matter come in, don't tell them you've got a bar in your office. <laughs> don't tell them you've got beer taps and wine coolers and everything else because, believe it or not, at the last minute when our folks at our Cox corporate entity said that they had a bar, they said, well, the bar's got to go. And our savings.com guy said, well, no, that's part of our culture. It's not going or we're not doing this deal. I mean, think about, I mean, who would have thought, right, that this whole deal could be done on a stupid bar that they have drinks in every once in a while. But anyways, that's, that's that. Um, so alternatives, when we looked at alternatives, you know, they ranged from the profitable business to the pure startup bleeding, you know, bleeding uh, money. And so all of those points in the decision process, do we want to replace their management team? Do they have good technology? Will we have to spend another two or three years to get these guys up to the same place that savings.com was? So we used kind of savings.com as the benchmark and compared everybody around that. Um, so we did have good alternatives. We just didn't think we had a better alternative than savings.com at the time. Um, and the team dynamics were really important to us. So Fred mentioned culture a little bit before. Some of these other companies were, you know, had a culture of Japanese-based culture, which would have not worked very well for our organization. Um, some of these guys w were arrogant, so that wouldn't have worked very well. And so we, we took all of that into stride when we were looking about true alternatives. Um, yeah, so anyways, talked about that. So our goals um, as a uh, buyer was to get investors out of the company. So they had a lot of VCs in their organization. We wanted to get those guys out of the way. Um, we wanted to retain the, the management team and employees because we were planning on running that company as they exist today. We didn't want anybody to leave. And since that time, we've only had one person, the executive management, leave. And that was really to pursue a better opportunity, and now he wants to come back. So we've really kept that management team in, intact. We wanted to tie investor earning potential to the company performance. So again, we wanted to pay as least amount of cash that we could and tie it all to their business plans that they were selling the company on. And we were pretty successful at that. And then don't, don't overpay on your initial cash up front. So as a buyer, these are the things that I think you need to think about. As a seller, you will be fighting against these things, right? And so there's a happy medium in between, and that's where the relationship building is really important to these deals. Um, from a structure perspective, um, we had an initial cash payment out front to investors, pretty big chunk of money. We had an earn out based on company performance that's over a couple years. Um, and then we've got a management bonus and uh, MBO pool. So again, more incentives to keep the management team around. Um, and so on the initial cash payment up front, um, one of the things to consider as a seller, and it kind of hurt these guys, the original founders, they, they took about $4 million of investment from some VCs and they put it in the bank. All right, that was not too long before they decided to sell to us. And so that capital never got used and it sat in the bank. But at time of initial payout and stocks and valuation, most of the cash that we paid up front went to the VCs because of that big investment that they made. And so the founders of the company actually got less cash up front because they took money they didn't use. And so that's something that you think in your capitalization, if you're actually building a business to sell it, you need to be really smart about how you manage your cap table and who's invested and when you need money. 
if you're going to imminently sell it. Um, so that's hurt them, and so most of their money is being made on these earnouts or management bonus, which is performance-based, not necessarily guaranteed. All right, so uh, valuation process. If you've ever been involved in any of this, again, it's really detailed math stuff. It hurts your head quite a bit. Um, you know, we modeled new revenue streams like we talked about. Uh, we did joint modeling between the smart people, but, uh, between uh, savings.com and Valpac. Uh, we did uh, financial models that were, you know, discounted cash flow, present future value of money, um, including our, what we thought our synergies were, excluding those. And at the end of the day, we actually bought the company on just their plan with no synergies. We didn't pay for any of the synergies that we thought we could get. Um, and then valuation message, message, discounted cash flows and multiples on revenue and EBITDA. Some pretty standard ways to value a company. There weren't any clear comps or, or comparables in the marketplace in the affiliate marketing space. I mean, since then, Retail Me Not's IPO'd hundreds of millions of dollars. That's their closest competitor. Um, so that's kind of the method. This is kind of what they, it looks like. So this is a pure startup culture. Very open culture, you know, they kind of a loft feel. They're out in Santa Monica, California, like I mentioned. Um, you know, ping pong tables, open workspaces, et cetera. So it gives you kind of a feel for what that looks like. If you looked at the Valpac organization, we're not here yet. We, we, we aspire to be here, but we're not here. And we do, and we have a ping pong table and, and an Xbox Kinetic, and we, we have some of that stuff, but it doesn't look and feel like this just yet. We're trying to get our culture to here. So one of the cool things culturally is they're helping to drive our 40-year-old company to act like a startup, which is really helping us you know, through our agile processes re-envision how we work at Valpac. And these guys are an example about how we want to work. So that's kind of the, the gist of it. Um, I gave a speech back to a startup series group back in February or March. And they had some questions here. So I can read these off and answer them, or we can just a answer so, questions. The parent company is privately held, so there's no regulatory. That's correct. Okay. Yes, very nice. Very nice. Trust me, very nice. Yeah, it's still very complicated, but still very nice. So Chris, talking about the business models, mm -hmm. like you talked about their business, savings.com being pay for performance versus you versus it's like a CPM. Right. How do the business models merge? You know, that seems to be a challenge out from outside in terms of how you manage two different Sure. Models. So so one of the synergies that we're going after that we've done pretty successfully so far, so we'll take a Macy's or JC Penney's or a Kohl's. And so they're used to dealing with savings.com on an online affiliate process, which is a common thing, right? So what we're going back to them now is saying, okay, let's, let's reinvent the way you, we drive consumers into your stores. We have this Valpac print asset over here that drives 40 million people every month. And so we are actually now distributing Kohl's and JCPenney's offer through our Valpac envelope at no cost to JCPenney's or Kohl's. And it's all based on per, per performance, either driving people offline to online to purchase or taking that piece of paper, going in store, and being scanned on the barcode, or some POS integration. So that's an example where we could never set, Valpac could never sell JCPenney's on our print product because it was just too expensive because we demanded that cash up front. So now with the savings relationship of paper performance, we change that model and provide what, what I call kind of a disruptive um, event to JCPenney's because they have an offline group that is responsible for generating in-store sales, and they've got an online group that's responsible for driving online sales. Those two groups don't usually talk. They usually hate each other, and they have different budgets. So here, Cox Target Media is bringing savings and Valpac together to them and saying, don't worry about these various groups. We need to kind of think about this at a, at a higher level because we're gonna drive people in-store or online to your organization through print or through online like nobody else can right now but it disrupts those organizations because they have to talk internally. And that's a big struggle. Yeah? Did you contact savings.com initially or did they contact you? Was it through a mutual, um, somebody network with somebody over there, no, have a previous relationship? How did the initial? Yeah, so Fred, Fred in the back of the room it used to be responsible for all of our partnerships. 
And so I think you actually found and went and visited them back in 2010 just as a partnership visit, somebody interested that we might want to share content with. Um, and then we had some additional conversations at ILM West um, that were a little bit more formal, and then the wheels kind of started turning. So I mean, I would say Fred is probably the one that started the conversations, um, and then it just kind of blossomed from there. Yeah? Is, is the, uh, I guess the, the center of gravity for Valpac seems to be here. Uh, how much consideration did you guys give to, okay, well, we're going to develop synergies, you know, the Safety Tech Com, obviously, in Santa Monica. Yep. Uh, so even though you're both managing national accounts, you, you get kind of this, this natural aggregation. We do this, we do that. Uh, how much did you take that into consideration? How much uh, of an impact is that going to have? So, so the first thing we did after the deal was done, and, and we actually started started doing this a little bit before the ink was, was officially done on the paper, is we started weekly calls with the tech group. So between Valpac.com and savings tech groups, we said, okay, we wanted to get aligned on what we were doing. Um, and that had some uh, product people in it, had some technologists in it. So immediately we put people together, the smartest people from both organizations, on a call once or twice a week to start driving those synergy discussions and what we were working on and how we could work together. We also did the same thing with the key sales assets. And so immediately we started working as a team through conference calls and we did site visits. Um, we all met, the, the executive teams met in Austin, kind of common ground for both companies and mapped out what our synergies were gonna be. Um, so we did it in very much of a collaborative way, making sure we both kept our core businesses running. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. It's conference calls, you know. It's if we if we need to do WebEx or Google Hangout or something, we'll do that. But for the most part, it's just a conference call. Jump on a conference call, and so within three or four months, I would say that some of the comments that we were getting back from them is that oh, it feels like we've been working together for ten years. You know, we we had gelled so good as a, a leadership team, and that's why culture is so important because we immediately were able to start acting on synergies and new revenue streams versus, you know having people close their walls off and saying, I don't want to talk to you or, or what have you. Or consolidation concerns about, well, we're just going to move you from Santa Monica to, to Tampa. That's not our intent. So, yeah. And how about the other acquisition targets that were on the list? As the negotiations were going on with Savings.com, did you guys have relationships being established at some level, or did they were just target the wall? With the, other, with the other acquisition targets. So we were working with um, their bankers and uh, talking with their CEOs or, or executive teams as well through conference calls. Um, we, we didn't move far enough to actually getting into site visits and diligence, um, but we clearly had relationships built with those other leaders and their bankers and had their, their um, financials and what they were trying to accomplish and what we were trying to accomplish. We did, we did, and um, you know, it, it's interesting that very quickly you can kind of size up an opportunity. At least I, I got into a pretty good, good way of doing that to say, okay, if we pick X, these are all the things I need to do, you know, when comparing to Savings.com. So I had something to compare to, which made it easier. But yeah, we went pretty deep with some of those guys. What else? Any other questions? Me one more question. Yep. After this deal, if you look to the future, as the technologies change, like the mobile or mm -hmm. social, or even as you look at the API and all that, if you have two different companies, how are you looking at, like, how do you take the future direction together? So, so that's part of my role. As um, I actually work for Cox Target Media over both of these brands. So part of my role with Fred's and some of the senior executive teams on both sides is to say, what are we going to work on together? and Who's going to drive it? Who's going to lead it? There'll be technologies brought from Valpac to the party, and there'll be technologies or, or uh, thought processes brought from savings.com. So since we acquired savings.com, they are in the process right now of releasing a grocery CPG application, which provides a whole new vertical for both of our businesses to sell into. Um, they built the technology. We actually made a, another small investment in a company that had CPG databases um, since the acquisition. And so this is, a, this is where an example of where savings.com has run with the technology platforms. 
but yet our Valpac sales reps and savings are going to be co-selling that. Um, and likewise, Valpac is actually ahead of savings in the mobile marketing space or the mobile platform space, so we're bringing mobile technologies to them. Does that answer your question? Were they, so they were owned by the founders of the company, but they had, I guess you could say, financial obligations to some of the investors, but it wasn't, yeah. the investors really had no say in the sale? No, they did. They had to sign off on the sale. Okay, they did. Yeah, they had, you know, they had considerable shares of the company as, as the founders did as well. So, um, you know, basically we took the term sheets. They had a board. You know, they took that to the, their board and everybody had to agree on it. So, so both parties had to say yes. Their founders and the investors both had to agree. Yeah, we treated them as one. You know, that you guys got to sign this agreement because it's all stake, stakeholders from the board perspective. From a uh, negotiation perspective, we had a great relationship with the founder who had a great relationship with their board and their major investors. And so once we got to the right point where we thought it was fair on both sides, he sold it to the rest of the investors to sign up and get on board with it. Yeah. Lynn. So, um in your negotiation, you got a lot of highs and lows. Mm -hmm. uh, like, of course, initially you give the very low figure and they have to say no, and the uh, end, like, some come up with the bar table and all. But any any point of time in this long chain of discussion, you found, Jesus Christ, now this is going to fall down. So, like, yeah. anything like that when you really, really felt that. So, so emotionally, uh, I felt three or four times where the deal was dead, where I was pissed off, I wanted to walk away, and I was done. Six, 6 a.m. in the morning on a Saturday, and it's like, done. I'm not doing this anymore, right? We got other things to do. It's taking too much, much of our time. They, they had some moments where they thought the same thing. And so, the only, again, the only thing that kept us through those highs and lows is being able to get on a phone call and say, look, we're, we're all adults here. Let's, you know, we understand your point. Do you understand our point? And we got to talking about it, and that's the only thing that kept it alive, or else we would have walked away. And they probably would have walked away. They almost walked away because we lowballed them the first time, and they didn't expect a lowball. They said, "What's the deal? We, you said you weren't going to lowball us, but we have a parent company that told us to lowball them." It's like, okay, well, that's you know, it's kind of how it started. So, yeah, we we, again, at the end of this, I felt exhausted, and I think they were popping champagne bottles. So, so I was glad to be done and moving on. So besides the money part and their bar table, is there anything they really cared about when they were on the table, like something uh, like about their employees? Or so culture was extremely important to them as well and fit. So they didn't want to sell to a company that was going to downsize all their employees or cut all of their people out and move it to Florida. They, they wanted to make sure that they had an agreement from us that really we want you to keep growing your core business. They have a very strong view of the consumer, meaning they are helping people save money on a budget every single day through, through their content. And so they didn't want us to come in and disrupt their business model for pure profit, right? So, so that's part of the culture thing we have to get to because you know they were selling to an operator of businesses not somebody that was just going to give them a hundred million dollars to go have fun and build a bunch more cool stuff. Um, so that was a concern that we, we talked through and we got through. Good question, Fred. So after the engagement, marriage, then the honeymoon, <laughs> now uh, deal is done. What are some of the lessons learned? What are some of the uh, challenges and the unexpected surprises that you've seen? So, uh, so some of the challenges I think are around deal structure and expectations. And so, again, I talked about them taking a bunch of money from their VCs, and when we did our initial cash payment, the majority of the percentage of the payout went to pay off those investors. So a lot of the employees and, and key founders didn't get a lot of cash up front. So one of the things that they were, they mentioned very often is that you are incenting us with our own money from a performance perspective. So. You know, they felt they should have been paid out up front, and we felt they should have earned it. So they almost think that we bought the company on their, using their own money, which is ba paid over time based on performance. So that was something that I think, looking back, we should have been more cognizant of. Um, I think they did the deal, and so if you look at the deal terms, it's like, well, you signed off on the deal. You approved the deal. But afterwards, I think when they start, it started settling into them, 
it's like, wow, I gotta wait two years for all this money or a year for this money or what have you, and it's only based if we make certain metrics. Um, so we've had a lot of conversations over the last six months about the first earnout payment and the first management bonus, which is also tied to performance goals um, and stock options, stock price, et cetera. So I think one of the biggest things is just expectations and being able to have those conversations and make sure they know that we care about the employees because we probably could have driven about half the employees away by just sticking to the terms of our deal. If we just black and white stuck to those terms and said, nope, we're not paying you anymore, we're, this is the deal, you signed it, then probably half the company would have left. But we've been working on making sure that they get whole and that they get rewarded for their, their work as well. So that was one big aspect of, of what went right and what went wrong. Yeah. Then how has uh, you know, the benefits been since then? As you said, they needed, they didn't really get the benefit of their own money in any yep. sense. But how's the, the uh, what they've done as far as you know, building your business gone since that time? So, so another thing that is that is probably something to be very cautious of is um, the way they operate their business based on the terms that we bought the company for. And so they had gross profit calculations they had to hit. They had several metrics that we put in place that said, you don't get an earn out unless you hit this plan th that they agreed on. But what that does is that switches some of the m management about how you're running the company to that metric versus growth. So when we look at, you know, they, they are very close to hitting their gross profit calculation, but their growth has not, not been on the top line revenue side as much as we wanted to see. So cash flow is okay, gross profit is, is kind of right where they were trying to manage it to, but they, they underspent a million dollars worth of investment because they were working on this, right? And so now we are trying in our second year of there not to say, look, get back to revenue growth. You're gonna have to spend some of your money. You know, don't worry so much about hitting this gross profit thing that we locked you into. So we almost disincentivized growth from a top line perspective. So we've learned about that and said, ooh, you know, probably good that we did that initially, but now we get, need to amend that. And even though we got deal terms in place, we're looking at, okay, how do we take care of you guys without having to hit this target? So that's a, that's a learning as well. Like what else? Yeah. No, I think you're up. Like, talk about Tampa versus Santa Monica. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the cultures are different, as you said. The cost structures are different, and also even from you, many of you can do wise and all that. A little bit more on the so, and I'll, I'll do this from a general company perspective because I, I think they're smart people on both coasts. But when I look at savings.com, which is a, grant, a startup built from the ground up, you know, they could only hire the best and the brightest to drive their company. When I look at Valpac, who is a 40-year-old organization, we got a lot of people that have been there 20 plus years, right, that have grown up with the company. And so what I see immediately is the talent within the organizations is, is vastly different. So our product people at savings.com are all MBA, Harvard type people, high thinkers, very critical thinkers. That doesn't match up too well with the product people we have on the Valpac side. And so from a people perspective, it's very different from a talent perspective. You know, L, the whole LA area is just a little bit more eclectic and has a different mix of people than the Tampa Bay area. Um, we have our savings.com developers actually in Santa Barbara so we've got the university right there as a feeder to their tech centers. And if you want to stay in Santa Barbara, there's not a lot of places to work. So for tech people, it's a really good place to pull from. And I wouldn't say that we have that same thing in Tampa that's, or, or Pinellas County that feels the same way. So any, any other questions? We've got a few more minutes. You guys want to know any of these questions, answers to these questions? What other kinds of companies you're looking to acquire now? <laughs> Good question. Um, I mean, this was a pretty big acquisition, so I think we need to sit on this one for a little while. Uh, I mentioned we did a very small acquisition of a uh, data company that's around the CPG grocery space. And so I think what we're looking for is being opportunistic again about companies that can provide us rich data assets or uh, futuring mobile or POS integration systems. Um, and the question that Fred and I always struggle with is, do we partner or do we try to buy? 
And there are so many partnership opportunities with startups as well is that we don't mind partnering and investing with companies either and not fully owning them. So we've got lots of partnerships with from everybody from Google all the way down to small, small mom and pop inventors. How do the partnerships typically work out or is it all in place? Um, we have some folks that manage our partnerships. So we've got some key people that develop those partnerships. Um, I would so say... Um, so uh, there are some very big companies that we are we have direct teams on both sides of our buildings talking together on a regular basis for uh, either local or national partnership ideas where we may bring content to their technology assets we may be bring sales pressure to their to, to create content for their networks How are you defining content? Uh, offers so transaction, what we talk about is promotional content that drives transactions. So typically in our world, that would be $5 off your pizza or 20% off your Macy's shopping experience. So these are offer content that you have to get from merchants who have budgets. So there needs to be a relationship there at a sales level. And then you need mass distribution through either our own properties or through partnership properties to distribute that. And the local offer space is becoming a hyper uh, competitive marketplace because everybody wants that content to drive their mobile app or their desktop experience or their consumer audience, you know, in, to engage their consumer audience. So we've actually got more people coming to us now about that offer content to drive transactions in their collective ecosystems. And that's one of the partnership angles that we do today. Chris, you have a new stream team, what do you see as the biggest challenge in the marketplace now for growth? Um, so one of the things, one of the things that happened as an outcome of our purchase, so savings.com had some technology that we, we called KMS, Keyword Management System. So it's a, in essence a bidding system for Google keywords, right? So savings.com drives a lot of their top line revenue and profit through profitable search. So we will bid on all those terms and we have a computer system that knows when to bid and what to bid and how to raise the price or, or not for the CPC costs. And we do that in a profitable manner. So when we bought savings.com in, in large part because of that technology, this was, a, this was quoted in the press as a $100 million deal. Well, you know what? Everybody popped up and said, holy crap, what are we missing? So Retail Me Not popped up into the marketplace and said, wow, we need to get into that space. We've traditionally been an SEO organic player, well, gosh, let's go build our own SEM system. And then all the other guys jumped in. So because of this deal being so visible in the marketplace, we've actually got a lot of people trying to compete against what we bought, the, the sweet spot of what we bought. So we're having to adapt and improve that as well along the way. Makes sense. Good stuff. Anything else? Well, thanks, guys. I appreciate you guys coming.